First off, congratulations. I had the pleasure to see it. And immediately I said, this is one of my favorite shows of the year so far. Because it's it's very different and it's very original. You had your own show, American Coco. Mm -hmm. And then you are also on Perry Mason. So there's an affinity for detectives. Yeah. Did you want to be a detective growing up? (laughs) (laughs) No, but I do think people are mysteries to be solved. A lot of times I'm like, I'm very curious about people, very interested in what makes them tick. I always, you know, my husband and I, we take long walks and we're always trying to solve all the world's problems. So I do like, I do like solving a mystery in my personal life. Okay. (laughs) Now, being that you are from Detroit, what parts of this is like really an ode to Detroit? Well, it all is. I mean, it it's all born from my experiences in the city, my love of the city, um, people who I've known there, you know, situations that have been sort of flipped and remixed and mm-hmm. crafted into this story, but it's all really inspired by the city. So no, I did not go looking for my Tinder date and end up in the Detroit <laughs> underworld, you know, but a hundred percent, my girlfriend would tell me about like, oh, she went out to this club and it turned out to be a weird sex club. And she didn't know, you know, all that. Stuff. Really? Yeah, I'm sorry. Can we just pause real quick? So that whole, like the whole sex club that's inspired by something true. Yeah, I was inspired by it. One of my friends was like, I went to this, uh, uh, her homegirl invited her to a, to an after hour spot. And she was explaining like, oh, and there was all kinds of sex stuff happening there as well. And I was like, really? <laughs> um, so yeah, I use, I use a lot of my friends' personal lives, uh, <laughs> a lot of the things that they tell me. Um, but yeah, so much of the show comes from something real. And then of course, you know, we craft, we crafted the mystery with a team of writers and everything. So right. yeah. Now in regards to the missing child, is that based on anything true? Yeah, it was inspired, a little ripped from the headlines. Um, there was a there was a missing boy um in Detroit who went missing when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And um like in 2020, a guy came into a, it was all in the news that a guy came into a Detroit police station and he said, I'm him. I'm the boy who went missing in the nineties. And for me, I was fascinated. I was refreshing the website, the, the Detroit free press website, trying to get to the bottom of it. And it turns out the guy was just off his meds or whatever. Uh, and I was exactly, intrigued. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's when I said, I was like, oh, this encapsulates so much that's interesting about Detroit, which is just like, there is the crime, there is the dangerous element, but then you find out this guy's just, you know, just needs to be on his meds or just needs some attention for an afternoon. And then you're laughing like, whose cousin is this? Like, (laughs) (laughs) and to me, it was like that thing growing up in Detroit where you never really knew if it was going to be kind of something dangerous that happened or just like something so funny that had you laughing so hard your stomach aches you know and um it's that razor's edge that I feel like I walked on in Detroit all the time growing up that I really wanted to um inform the tone of this show speaking of that you know there's a lot of comedic elements but it's more so and this is the one area that I really appreciated was that you're not trying to be funny but it's just like it felt as if if I were to say this to my friend that would be their reaction so it was a, it was a level of authenticity and the comedy as well as the darkness that I really really appreciated about this how are you able to yeah of course how are you able to you know make sure that those lines stayed as they were and didn't blur yeah I mean it was the thing always that people ask let's talk about tone like every time you know actors what is the tone you know it was something that we discovered you know in a first season show you really have to discover it um and of course you can talk generally like it's a little Atlanta, it's a little insecure, it's a little search party, it's a little only murders. But when we got all together, I think Chioke Nasor, who I can't believe that's the first time I'm saying his name today, because he's our pilot director and he's fantastic. But what he did was he really wanted to ground everything, you know, and he was right. Even sometimes I would say something silly should be written on Diara's classroom you know, mm-hmm. borders. And he'd be like, no, 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 everything has to be grounded because there were so many big moments in the series that, that I think, I think that really helped us pull people in. So that was one thing, which is keeping the, keeping it as grounded as possible as our baseline. And then the other thing is, you know, um, 
Nathan, our composer, had a lot to do with us balancing tone. It might be really subtle. You might not notice it, but that's sonically bringing us mm -hmm. comedy and the amping up the tension and all of that. And then the, the third thing is a lot of it was created in the edit, you know, how long you spend in the tension versus when you cut to the joke and, and, um, Miles Orion Feldsot, who's one of our EPs, that was really where he shined was in, was in the edit. I mean, he shined <laughs> a lot, but in the edit, he really, really worked with our editors, Iris Hirschner and Chet, Ch Chet and Chabik and, and Spencer to just create our specific, our specific tone um, and it was just a lot of trial and error and like that didn't work. Oh no, that feels good. You know, until we felt like we had something that was specifically our show. It sounds like there was so much love and like collaboration mm -hmm. put into this. I wanted to touch on the teacher side of you because while that's not the main aspect of it, why did you choose to make her a teacher? So my mother was a teacher and my mom decided to go back to college to be a teacher when I was about four, I think, four or five. And so I felt like a teacher too, because <laughs> I had gone to night school. You know, I went through the whole process with her. When she graduated, I remember she gave me like a little like a little cert diploma certificate as well, because oh, I had nice. been to so much night school. <laughs> I was like, this is <laughs> bullshit. Like I'm a kid. <laughs> I want to get out of here, you know? Um well, at least you have like on the job training if you are able to apply. <laughs> yes. And and so it did happen that I did kind of become a teacher by osmosis because when I first got to LA, everybody else waits tables and mm -hmm. I taught, I taught theater, I taught dance for many years and I could just walk in the classroom and without anyone having to tell me, I could control the classroom, even as half those kids were bigger than I was, you know, <laughs> um, and so I think I just have a lot of love for them because I know how, how how much dedication I watch my mother really work full time, go back to school, raise me and be really dedicated to that profession. Um, and it's just a subtle commentary on how hard it is to actually help someone as a public servant, not just teachers, but social workers, police officers, like any social servant really has a, has a tough job ahead of them. And I also think... Being in Detroit public schools and having, you know, a mom that's a teacher and all her friends, nothing scares them. <laughs> like they <laughs> see it all. They've seen it all. You know, uh, she says in the show, she's part warden, part, you know, like mm -hmm. you just that job en encapsulates so many other jobs. And um, in the pilot, mom, there's the there's the bit at the end where she realizes that her student's mom has gone back to jail. And my mother would say that. She would say, oh, this kid is acting crazy. His He must have gone to visit his dad in jail this weekend. Or, mm -hmm. you know, this person is doing this. They must be hungry. Like there's a lot of detective work with yeah. the profession. And in order to do it properly, you got to figure out what's going on with them psychologically and emotionally. And so it just felt like a good um, profession for an amateur detective because they would know a little bit about everything, even as a homeroom teacher, you know, a little bit of science, mm -hmm. a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Um, and so it was very intentional to pick that that profession for her. Um, and it's like I said, it's a ode to my mommy and to the teachers that I had at at Bates who just love the shit out of us. Um, and then also just the practicality of like nothing scares them, you know. Yeah. No, that's why I really loved it because there was a little detective work when you were putting together the storylines between the students, but then it was also like the care because you were doing her hair. So it was like, it was like the importance, especially of teachers that look like you. So like, I was just like, I, I really like, you know, just add it to me like in the show. When you were coming up with the show, when it came to your cast picking, did you ever have them in mind as you were making the characters? Yeah. So it's so funny. Brian Terrell Clark, who plays Mr. T, is a friend of mine he's someone who I've known for a while and he actually said that to me there's a line in the show where he says I may be gay but I'm still a nigga mm -hmm. and he said that to me one day we were actually I think we we're at our friend's house and we were talking and he said that and I actually wrote it down sometimes people say things that I like and I'll put it in my notes and I wrote it down and so later when we were having auditions you know he came in and I thought he would be great generally just because I don't always see a queer man that has some masculinity to him that, you know, is representing that side of the queer community. A lot of the times they're very sassy. And I, we intentionally wanted him to be a gay best friend who's like, I'm not going shoe shopping with you. Stop. <laughs> you know? 
Um, and but as a side effect of me loving like the queer community since I'm a kid, like I had a lot of queer male friends who also came in for <laughs> for the show. So it really could have gone a lot of different ways. But I think because um Brian really had that kind of that, that quality, I must have like stored that <laughs> away and just, you know, it, I'm glad I, that we cast him because I used his I used his line. But yeah, he definitely he was definitely in my in my head throughout the process. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his, so I'm glad that he's he's on there. Um, he's, and you have the legendary Felicia Rashad. I know. <laughs> <laughs> How was it finding out that she was interested in doing it, and what was it like working with her? Because I love the role that you have her in, by the way. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it went it went through a pretty traditional route. You know, we went through our our casting went through her agent and. And she accepted the role. She said she loved the writing, which felt really good. Um, I remember her being, there was like a read poster that was in the, like the library when I was a little kid where she was like holding a book. <laughs> so it felt like, it felt like she was always calling to me. Um, she was really great to work with for a lot of reasons. For one, everything you think about her is true. She's very classy. It feels like she's floating on a cloud. You know, she, she is, she's, she's prayed up like when we finished I sent her a crystal to her house because I was like I know you be in the room meditating and she was like I have a meditation room I, was like, I I know you do um her and you could just feel her in the universe they're like these um but the other side of her being really classy and all that is like she was also about it like she was so down and in did you in episode three where we're in this crack house and I remember being like, guys, is this a working crack house? Because it was so much <laughs> dust. And I was like, this place is disgusting. And she never complained. I was going like, can we get her eye here? <laughs> so she never complained. She went up and down those steps. She had a very um, solid take on her character. She was just ready. And, and she didn't come in and just go, I'm Felicia Rashad. I'm going to walk through this and go home. Mm -hmm. She was just very invested and that felt really good. And, and you understand why people are who they are, you mm -hmm. know, like same with Morris, you're just like, Oh, he's professional. He's on time. He's a joy. He's kind. Like it's, it's sometimes I say the, the shorter, the resume, the bigger, the diva, because mm. consummate professionals, they don't play, you know, why they are, where they are. Yeah, that is real. And just last question. Um, so I'm very big on like, I feel sometimes people don't know how to really support a show. I think people are very big on like, I'm going to wait till it's over to binge it and things like that and not understanding the importance of watching it when it comes out or things like that. Mm -hmm. So if, if what would you say to like tell your viewers like, you know, how to actually support this show if they like it and things like that? Yeah, that that's such a great question because that's what got me on Run the World. I was like, I'm gonna let them all pile up and then I'm gonna get stars and it was gone. I couldn't believe it. Um, I do think it's important, especially now, they aren't necessarily letting shows, you know, giving shows three seasons to see how they do. You know, the community has to show up now. <laughs> um, you, please watch the show. I understand, listen, Detroit people, I understand the Detroit inclination to want to use your grandma's password or your cousin's password. But if you could just sign up for me, I would really, I would really appreciate it. Um, sign up, you know, it's great to show that the, that the show is generating signups. Um, you can cancel it after the show is over if you want, but um, yeah, sign up and watch the show, tweet about it, thread. Are we threading thread about it? Um <laughs> you know, get on your socials and, 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 and talk about it. If you're enjoying it, if you're not, shh. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, and rec, I, I say have watch parties, you know, I am all about community and I would love for this show to be something that people gather around and talk about and argue about, you know, cause DR makes some questionable decisions on this journey. Yes. So I, I want to hear it. It's fine. I want to hear y'all <laughs> about what she's doing on Twitter and threads. Okay. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. Sharifa, right? Is that right? Yes. Yes. Really nice to meet you. Nice meeting you as well. And I love the show. So I'm like rooting for its success because I want a season two. You know? Yes, girl. <laughs> <laughs>